back here tonight for the always exciting annual USC George Washington Lecture. I am Sarah Colson. I'm the 22nd region of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. And I think as most of you know, we are the organization that purchased Mount Vernon prior to the Civil War. And we have continuously owned and operated the estate these last 160 years, furthering our original mission to preserve and protect Mount Vernon and George Washington's incomparable legacy. In case you couldn't tell, joining me this evening are my 10 fellow vice regents or board members who always look forward to this lecture in advance of our fall council, which begins this weekend. Ladies, would you please stand? <laughs> Thank you, thank you for all you do on behalf of the Mount Vernon cause. I would especially like to thank our Vice Regent for California, Mary Beth Borthwick and her husband, Hal, who regrettably could not be with us this evening. Um, but Mary Beth, as you may know, is an alum of USC and the Borthwick's generous gift allows this important partnership between Mount Vernon and the University of Southern California to grow and prosper. Now in our eighth year, this popular series explores George Washington's lifelong accomplishments and contributions to democracy, providing a better understanding of Washington as a man, as well as his remarkable leadership and professional achievements. So please join me in a round, a virtual round, in thanks of Mary Beth. I also would like to acknowledge and, and give a shout out to Doug Bradburn, Mount Vernon's president and CEO, who Doug is here with us this evening and, and I would be remiss in not commenting on his remarkable leadership, particularly these past 18 months. Doug, we look forward to you and your team being with you this weekend. And most importantly, I would like to thank each of you for coming tonight and for your continued support of Mount Vernon this past year, and especially these past 18 months. The Mount Vernon Ladies Association has never accepted government funding, beginning with our original purchase in 1858 and continuing up through and including the most recent pandemic. But make no mistake, without support of generous donors like yours, we would never be the vibrant institution that we are today. So a sincere and heartfelt thanks for all you do for Mount Vernon. And now I would like to get the program started and turn it over to Kevin Butterfield, our executive director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington here at Mount Vernon. And Kevin, Kevin will introduce our wonderful panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am thrilled uh, to be able to uh, welcome you uh, tonight to this great event. Uh, uh, thank you, Mrs. Colson, and, and thank you to all of you uh, for being here tonight. I am uh, excited to talk to you a little bit about discovery. The desire of 18th century Americans like George Washington to know the land to the West is a defining characteristic of their moment. The makeup of the soil, the sources of water, the topography, the terrain, they wanted to know all these things. And these are surprisingly similar to the kinds of questions that humanity is asking today of places far, far away, places like the surface of Mars, elsewhere in the solar system. And tonight's event will feature a discussion of discovery, of exploration. And I'm uh, extraordinarily pleased to be able to introduce you tonight to Dr. James Green. He is the chief scientist of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, also known as NASA, uh, where he serves as the principal advisor to the administrator and other senior officials on all things related uh, to science and exploration. Uh, prior to this important appointment, he had an, what I think is actually an even cooler title as the director of the Planetary Science Division at NASA headquarters from 2006 to 2018, where I learned tonight in talking to him that nothing left Earth without his signature. That's pretty cool, right? Uh, under his leadership, NASA has managed uh, exploration missions uh, like we'll talk about tonight, including the New Horizons spacecraft, uh, spacecraft uh, uh, flyby of Pluto and the landing of rovers on Mars. And I think we'll spend a lot of time on Mars. 
Dr. Wood uh, was also the lead consultant uh, on the 2015 science fiction movie, The Martian, uh, a film I've seen more times than I'm willing to admit in this room. Uh, and he will um, be joined in conversation tonight, uh, not just with me, but with my colleague, Dr. David Sloan from USC's Saul Price School of Public Policy. And if you've been to these events, events before, you've met David, uh, but it's, it's a wonderful partnership. And as Mrs. Colson mentioned, uh, one that goes back a long ways and connects Mount Vernon with the University of Southern California in, in a really great and and. In, important way, something I'm excited to extend tonight in talking about exploration, both in the 18th century and in the 21st century, probably even beyond. So uh, please join me in welcoming our guests to the stage where we'll have a conversation. I'll take this one. Great. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, let me extend my welcome from the University of Southern California uh, to you, to this great event. Uh, it has been a remarkable partnership. We are truly uh, in great gratitude to our Mary Beth and Hale for their generosity, but we're in some ways even more indebted to first Doug, then Kevin, and to you for the opportunity to talk about George Washington's legacy in multiplicity of ways over the last eight years. Um, and so tonight, let's see if we can do that again in a different way. Let's go to space. <laughs> Jim, exploration is an opportunity. Uh, Washington surveys Western Virginia looking for real estate. NASA explores space to understand the solar system. With which, within which we live. Kevin and I have built this interview around the idea that exploration is a central element of human life. Can you feel the connection between Washington riding through the woods, going through the dry streams and the wet streams, and watching a digital screen as the rover lands on Mars and begins to survey, literally, to use your words in our earlier conversation, or survey the landscape? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, as you know, David and, and Kevin, I love history. And it's easy for me to imagine how excited George Washington would be from what we see too. So on Mars today, we have several rovers. And one rover uh, that we landed in 2011 is the Curiosity rover. And I'm gonna show a panorama. And this is right after it landed. So these are made up of images from the rover that are stitched together. This is a fabulous area on Mars. And what you see uh, when we do this pan is this is uh, all sedimentary rock. This is rock that was built up when it was underwater and sediments flowed and fell to the surface. This is where an enormous lake was in the past. Uh, Washington, I'm sure, in his journeys, and he traveled a lot, would go through streams which are dried up. These are the mud flats that he would see in these lakes. And in fact, some of these underneath the sides, you can see rocks that have been rounded, that have come from the hills, rolled down and accumulated, and then became conglomerates just like we see here on Earth. So these are the kind of things that we're seeing on Mars. And indeed, the surveyor that we have is not George Washington himself, but it is indeed the Curiosity rover. Uh, Curiosity is designed to really go find out as much as we can about Mars. This is how NASA does things. We let planetary scientists with their robotics, their orbiters, their landers, their rovers, understand environments before we send humans. So these are indeed our trailblazers. These are indeed our explorers. We were discussing this and it's an amazing thing to me. I, maybe I'm really old, I don't know. But you know, I have this image of the of Mars as, as this red, very dry sort of, dead planet. And uh, talking to you, it sounds like it's, you know, 
place we could go for a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> not quite, not quite. It is an arid planet. It's very dry there. In fact, it's, it, it's drier on Mars than the Atacama Desert. But uh, it also has a very thin atmosphere. Mars lost a lot of its atmosphere. But what we know from our rovers and orbiters is indeed Mars was a blue planet early on in its history. When Earth started having life four billion years ago, Mars was a blue planet like Earth. And it went through a, a rapid climate change. And this is really an exciting era for us to understand what's happening on the planets because what, can, what happened on Venus can happen on Earth. What's happened on Mars can happen on Earth. So we've used the concept of comparative climatology to understand our own Earth. But in terms of exploring, indeed, uh, Mars holds a number of secrets for which these rovers are uncovering. So the, the first major set of science that Curiosity did on the red planet was to really pulverize these sediments and bring up material uh, that we want to scoop up and taste inside the rover. And here you see the beautiful red surface, the oxidized surface, and this is from an imager on the mass looking down on the soils. And here are other uh, areas on Mars that the rover has, uh, has actually uh, dug up. These holes are about the size of a dime. You get down about an inch to an inch and a half. And this very first one that was here, you see the first two, one was just a test one. Yeah, it works. And then we did the bigger one. This shocked us. You know, you think scientists know everything, right? But in reality, they're pretty conservative. And, 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 you know, they don't like to lean forward and, and extrapolate and make big statements. And, you know, that's not in our ilk so much. But this shocked us. It shouldn't have, but it did. Mars is not, has just this red patina only on the surface, not deep. And when we, when we dug in the dirt like this, this is gray Mars. This is dark soil. And so we brought that into our our instruments and we teased it out. It's got carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Everything that exists between my two fingers right here is on that surface. The soils have nitrates, great fertilizer, and they're moist. A, a lot of water that was on ancient Mars is locked in its crust and in certain areas that we're just now teasing out, including what we believe are underground aquifers. Things that Washington in his era would have to do, finding the resources, looking for water. Now, the things that we do with the rovers are indeed exploring these areas to find the resources that we know we're going to need. Do we need to bring all the water for humans to live on the surface? The answer is no. Mars has actually an enormous amount of water. It's just trapped in certain areas, mostly in ice. But we're now finding, even below the surface, large reservoirs. There's a lake that's been discovered about a mile deep, which is too deep for us to get to right away. But it tells us that there's probably an aquifer system. And we may be able to see signs of that with our future missions. Now that we know that there's something like that, we now know what to do next. But these soils are such that we can grow things in them. Now, these are alkaline. They're they're, they're uh, such that you could grow uh, asparagus uh, and beans, okay? Uh, not so acidic, uh, so uh, potatoes, you know, uh, we believe acidic soils are elsewhere on Mars, though. They tell us that because of the range of things that we're seeing in the holes, there's a range of acidity. So if you watch the movie The Martian, you know, yes, uh, Mark Watney could probably grow potatoes. Well, there's also some other things that we're finding that are hazardous. Uh, there are some toxins that, that are appear to be on the surface, but not everywhere. So these are the kind of things that we're finding out that indeed Washington had to do. You know, agriculture was such an important uh, activity, you know, and he was very well into that. He rotated his crops from tobacco to wheat. Uh, he has in his library just a large number of volumes on agriculture. And as a president, he even started uh, 
an agricultural co uh, co uh, council uh, that was designed uh, to come together and talk about the best practices in agriculture. He was really a forward thinker in that particular area. So he would love this. He would love this. Yeah, I, I can believe that. <laughs> uh, remind everyone out there. So this room, uh, there, I'm going to ask Stephen McLeod and perhaps others uh, to pass cards so that you can ask questions. Uh, just write down a quick question on the card and, and it'll come back and it will get fed up into this uh, little thing. Uh, but I'm also getting questions from a remote audience that's watching this event. And I actually have one for you already, Jim. And if you Super. wouldn't mind, um, and I, I don't know anything about this, so you can tell me if, if this is uh, a good description or not. Uh, something about the seven minutes of terror yes. uh, that the rovers go through to reach Mars. Yes. Uh, I don't know what this means, so obviously introduce us and tell us about it. All right, okay. So it turns out I have uh, one second out of a seven minute of terror. Okay. okay and here it is. <laughs> this is from an orbiter looking sideways as it's flying over at exactly the same time. Uh, Perseverance, our second rover that landed in February, was on its way down to the surface. Now, there are a thousand things that can go wrong when the, when the capsule carrying the rover hits the top of the atmosphere. It's going 13,000 miles per hour, and the rover has to sit down on the surface inches per second. All right? We have to take that entire momentum out. And so we do that with an ablative shield. Once we've ablated everything that we can ablate off the shield, we drop the shield and then we pop a chute. And here is an image, uh, a little vignette we've, uh, we've uh, exploded, uh, of uh, the capsule carrying Perseverance and its companion helicopter, Ingenuity, to the surface. And the circle is actually where it's going to land. Circle is actually where it lands. So as, as it comes down, it then drops the chute and drops the rover to the surface. And then retro rockets uh, then stabilize the rover about 40 or 50 feet above the surface so that they then lower the rover to the, to the ground, just like we do with helicopters raising and lowering uh, pallets of, of supplies and equipments every day on the Earth. We did that on Mars. And then when the rover sits down, actually the neat thing about it is the rover is all curled up and as it's going down, it unfurls and the legs lock in and the wheels come around. And, I mean, it's really unbelievable. And we sit it down on the surface, the signal then goes up, we're, we're there, and we blow all the, all the lines and then the, the, the sky crane, we call it, this retro rocket system, flies away and crashes, and then we're on the surface. Hmm. It takes seven minutes from the time we hit the top of the atmosphere to land safely, okay? Now, Mars is so far away that in this particular instance, we were 11 light minutes away. So when we got the signal that Perseverance was at the top of the atmosphere, in reality, it was on the surface, one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, we got the confirmation uh, that indeed it happened. Now, Perseverance is landing, as you can see here, this fabulous, you know, sideways, sideways view. This area right here is a delta. This river flowing into this area, it's on the ancient shoreline of Mars's vast ocean. This delta has been built up over tens of millions, maybe several hundred millions of years, flowing into this area, dropping sediment as the water, fast moving water, hits the more uh, still water of this large lake, which then pours over into the ocean. And indeed, then it drops its silt. So if you took away the water in the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico, that's what it would look like. It's a delta. And deltas are famous for having light. You know, we, you know, George Washington probably, you know, uh, at the end of a river valley, uh, explored uh, walking through and looking at deltas. Um, uh, this is where we go to look for how the climate changed, why it changed, 
how fast it changed, and how did it affect the environment? Meaning, was life there or not? And what happened to it if it was? I gotta tell you, I have a whole set of questions. And every time he talks, I come up with new questions. <laughs> it's, it's getting a little irritating, actually. Um, uh, why isn't uh, New York on Mars? Why isn't the, the state of New York or the town? <laughs> why isn't New York, why aren't we sitting on Mars? We're, what happened? We're, we're moving What's the that. difference between there and here? Okay, first thing is I would say, we are on Mars. We've got, we've got our eyes <laughs> on Mars. We okay. have our explorers on That's Mars. Fair. Okay, we just had Lewis and Clark, but okay, we've got curiosity and perseverance. Okay, that's where we are right now. We'll get there. Give us some time because the rest of America was there to explore too. We just have to bring that information back, put it together, figure out those steps, understand where humans will go to utilize those resources. We have found, for instance, the old North Pole of Mars. It's actually sitting at about mid latitudes, about 42 degrees which is Washington, D.C. latitude, by the way. And it's a buried glacier. And it's water. It's about the size of the state of Arizona. And in some places, it's 750 meters thick. All right? That's like eight or nine football fields. Okay, thick. So we'll probably find an area for our first outpost to go there. And the plan is that for humans to explore, we're going to define an area called an exploration zone. It'll be about 200 kilometers in diameter. And then uh, what we need is about 40 ton of infrastructure, you know, housing, you know, mobility, uh, those things. Uh, this rover is one ton. Okay. We think we can drop 10 ton. We think we have the technologies to drop 10 tons. So 40 tons isn't bad. It just means four missions. And then we got to assemble that. And then that will be ready for humans. So we'll land in one area in this exploration zone. We'll live in another area. And then we'll explore the resources. We'll do science. We'll do uh, extract water. We'll extract the minerals. We'll typically build st structures using 3D printing, probably out of the Mars dust that's there, that's ubiquitous on the planet. So as a good public policy and planning uh, professor, I have to look at the other side of this optimism. Sure. These opportunities often come with costs. Yes. When the colonists pushed into the Allegheny, they, they ran into armed conflict. Yeah. Recent articles argue mining on the Mar moon or Mars or other planetary objects cannot be far behind. As a scientist, what might be the consequences of too much mining, too much human activity, too much? Um, in some sense, I think we all know that the moon's up there for sort of a balanced reason with the Earth. The, the, these planetaries seem to work together somehow. Yeah, it's and, very important for us. It's yeah. very important. It's surprisingly important, really. I mean, the moon stabilizes our rotational axis. So it only tilts from 24 degrees to 22 and a half degrees. Okay, so it's just a, just a little wobble. And in those wobbles, we go through climate change. We go through ice ages. So uh, it's important that the moon is there to stabilize that. And it's been very important. And, and it's probably provided an environment for complex life, us, to be able to arrive sooner rather than later on the planet. And do you worry that we'll screw that up? So <laughs> we Sorry. have, yes, the answer to the simple answer is yes, of course. All right. So the concept of going to Mars, in particular for humans, is that this exploration zone, we will continue to go to that one location for decades maybe at least 100 or more years before we make a decision to go elsewhere, hmm. okay? So we're confined. But even before then, 
the rovers that are sitting on the surface went through an extensive uh, amount of um, what we call sterilization, planetary protection. The concept is uh, anything we touch is full of microbes, full of earth life. Yeah. Part of our biosphere goes with us when we leave the earth unless we work hard to eliminate it. So the rovers are, Perseverance in particular, is incredibly clean. And it's that way because its job is to core rock, is to look for the geological history of the planet. So it creates cores that are about uh, three or four inches um, that are the diameter of a large Crayola creme. I say that because we have some kids in the audience. I used to say, you know, uh, chalkboard chalk, but they, they've never seen that, so they don't understand <laughs> what I'm talking about. But um, that's about the size. They put them in metal sleeves, and then we're planning to return those before the end of this decade. And it's that rock record that will tell us an enormous amount about the evolution of the planet. And our hope is to capture the right set of rocks that can tell us these kind of things. One, how the climate changed, and when did it change, and what potential life was there. Now, the rocks that we have here on Earth, you know, are made up of atoms that are in arrangements, and those arrangements are called minerals. There's over 5,000 minerals that we've identified here on Earth, but about 330 of them can only be made by life. The death of life is back in the soils and in the rocks. And so by returning the rock record, there may be a record of early life. And so that's also one of the exciting things. And, and, and we don't want to bring our life with us there only to bring back our life and think that that came from Mars. So that's, that's part of planetary yeah. protection. Now in bringing these rocks back, just say one other thing on it. We call that backward contamination. We don't want to bring potential life that is on Mars, that probably, if it does exist, it may be in microbial form, of course, because we, we don't see any life on the surface, and it's certainly no complex life. Uh, but microbial life might hitch a ride back, and so when the samples come back, they'll be quarantined. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome. And they'll be examined in quarantine until we deem them releasable, and then they'll be released to the world to analyze. Uh, one of the young people in the audience actually posted a question uh, in this card, uh, a young man named Chase, uh, and asked how much of Mars we've explored. And uh, you could, I'm sure, answer that different ways, but uh, how much have we explored closely? How much have we explored from a distance? And an entirely unrelated question, I'm going to throw in there just so you can yeah. uh, riff. Uh, ask a question about how if soils are similar, if all these things are similar, are we also going to find things like gems and diamonds and gold in places like Mars? So uh, how much have we explored and what might we find there in the precious metal sense? Well, those are all minerals. <laughs> and uh, so right now, with curiosity, we've started the process of really identifying what minerals are there. Uh, and we're going to continue that with perseverance. Right now, we're, you know, like only 280. But no minerals that we have found on Mars it hasn't been found on Earth. You know, we, they're, they're all the same minerals. Okay. So Mars is very Earth-like in, in those kind of ways. But we're not done with the analysis. We haven't found diamonds. Okay. None of the precious metals yet. How much but, have we explored? All right. Um, in, um, at, at, at low resolution, we've seen the whole planet. But in high resolution, we haven't. So if, um, if, if this table sat on the surface of Mars with our high resolution camera, we could see it. It'd be one pixel. We can see the rovers because there's several pixels. And pixels are the smallest unit in the image that you can get. So we can see really high resolution imaging of Mars. And the high resolution imager is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. It uh, uh, got to Mars in 2006, just as I was becoming planetary 
uh, director and uh, got it in orbit and uh, it started this high resolution mapping. So from 2006 to today, it has seen 4% of the surface at a high resolution. Hmm. Mars is that big, okay? So if you eliminate all the oceans on the Earth and squeeze all the, all the land masses together, that's about the size of Mars. Okay. okay. <laughs> we can keep talking about Mars pretty much through the whole thing. Yeah, we could. But let's take a minute and go back. Mm -hmm. Because I was fascinated. I've spent a couple of days, a little while, reading papers by you um, about the science that you, as chief scientist. And I found that you like to write about other things as well. Oh, yeah. As uh, Kevin also has about balloonists yeah. during the Civil War. Right. And then I, I found this really fascinating group of papers about the 1859 auroral event in the United States. Yeah. How important is it for us to understand past atmospheric events as we adventure more into space? Oh, it's, an, it, it's incredibly important, incredibly important. You know, just uh, as an example, climate change. We talk a lot about the change in climate. I'm a planetary scientist, so I look at the history of the Earth and its climate over 4.6 billion years. And the one statement that seems to be definitive is the climate has done nothing but change, right? Uh, 12,000 years ago, uh, you know, a mile high glacier sat all the way through Canada and into New York and in the upper part of the United States. And as that began to recede, it created the Great Lakes. Okay, civilizations have come and gone on this earth because of climate change, all right? Now today, we're in climate change, but we're also, we have to worry about the rate of change, you know, and that's, and that's uh, where we focus a lot of our attention on. We can't evolve out of something that changes on 100-year timescales, whereas our bodies can evolve over thousands of years in environments that change on that time scale. So rates are really important. But looking back in history, even, even on things as what you might think is mundane, mundane as aurora, aurora tells us there's been storms that started on the sun, huge coronal mass ejections that have occurred for which the magnetic fields and the and the mass that is lifted off that, that sun hitting the earth causes these auroras. And the auroras also have currents in the ionosphere, and these currents affect everything on the ground from the power grid to the laptop sitting on your lap. <laughs> and if we had a superstorm like the one in 1859, and that aurora went over Canada, went over the United States, went over Mexico, went over Central America and stopped in Colombia. And it was red. And it was a huge amount of energy that was dumped in our atmosphere with huge amounts of currents. The telegraph system at the time, we had about 125,000 kilometers of telegraph wire, virtually useless because the currents in the ionosphere affected the currents in the wires overloading the batteries and literally burning down some of the telegraph stations. And um, that superstorm we haven't seen, okay, in, our, in modern days. No one alive has seen a superstorm, but we see that they're there. One thing that we can tell is because of the low latitude aurora, and it's a red aurora, if we go back in history, maybe that'll tell us of a cycle that the sun has, that, that, that is going on at the sun that s extends well beyond a human lifetime. Hmm. And so as we do that, we see it in the Japanese records, in the Chinese records, and we've even gotten some records in Babylonia and some of the ancient cutiform records noting aurora at low latitudes. And we now recognize there's another massive cycle of storms that the sun puts out, okay? 
And so we have, uh, many years ago, deemed this whole area space weather because even though it's in space and it will affect our satellites, depending on how severe the storm is, can knock them out. But it can also knock out our power grids and our electronic equipment that we're so used to having today because we haven't designed them to accommodate anything like that. So uh, that now is another cycle we have to worry about. But that's, um, that's what science is all about. It's studying that, that record. Some of that was found out by going to newspapers and, and then seeing the headlines and extracting that information. And, and then modeling it, and then understanding it, and then, and then the historical writings that I mentioned uh, all the way back to several thousand years BC or, or, or times yeah, we, things. Well, yeah, I actually have a question from the audience, and this is uh, coming from another young person. Um, and it relates to something that I think you may even have footage of, but I, I, don't, I don't recall exactly, about the helicopter. Yeah. Um, so we have now, we, we have now flown on a second planet. Yes. That's pretty cool. Uh, and, cool. and a young person asked the question, how did you fit a battery onto the helicopter with enough power to maintain lift without weighing it down? Um, this, is, this seems like a big question. Uh, how does this work? And tell us a little bit about this, flight on Mars. Okay. Hey, Jim, why don't you show it? Okay. So, so here, is, uh, here is Perseverance. Okay. Uh, a lot of us call Percy. It's Percy Good. Me. Yeah. And, and here's Ingenuity. And uh, Ingenuity lived underneath the belly pan of Perseverance. And so when we landed it, we dropped the belly pan. And then we drove a little bit. And then dropped the helicopter. And then we drove away. So here's where we just set it down on the surface, right there. Okay? And then, and then we, uh, we, we moved about 50 yards away. And then we started doing a variety of tests. Now, when this idea first came to me as head of planetary, it actually came to me by uh, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory Director Charles Lachi. He says, Jim, I got a great idea. I think we can fly on Mars. And, and he had a couple of his engineers do some you know, rudimentary back of the envelope calculations, and, and he got so excited. And I said, Charles, that sounds fantastic, but you're going to have to propose it. If you want to get money, you know, the, the hard earned money that people in this country you know, through Congress appropriate to NASA, you're gonna have to earn our trust. You better, you better darn make sure you can fly, okay? So you're gonna have to write a proposal. And he did, okay? And we selected it. Now we selected it as a technology demonstration um, because we'd never did this before. Uh, the, 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 the team he put together was a fabulous team led by Mimi Ong. And, and she was so excited the first, for the first time uh, they actually built the, the, little, the, the, the little part of the helicopter with the, with the counter-rotating blades, so 2,300 revolutions you know, per second. I mean, it's incredible speed. Uh, she came to my office and said, okay, we've got our first flight in the vacuum chamber. chamber. So, so they, they put it in a chamber and then pumped down the, the gas such that it was the pressure of Mars. And she goes, watch this. She turns it on, and the, and the copter lifts up and then goes right to the wall. And she was so excited. I said, Mimi, it can't go to the wall. You know, <laughs> you know can you fix that? You know? And she says, well, look, it, 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 it had, it had a lofting ability. So going to the wall was no big deal. We could get off the surface. The rest we'll have to figure out. Mm -hmm. So that's all about how the blades and the shape of the blades and everything. This is a very small vehicle. You know, it could sit right here. The blades are about... You could sit right here. Yeah, sit right here. Sit right here. The, just barely, okay? The, the, the box is, um, is like uh, a 10 inches by 10 inches by 10 inches, okay? And the blades are about a yardstick long, okay? And, um, and they counter-rotate. That's why we don't need a tail blade. So um, uh, spin them up, okay? And then uh, um, up it goes. So um, we tested it in the chamber until they got it working. And then we decided, uh, okay, we're going we're gonna to send it to Mars and see if it works. But we're going to go through a, a variety of tests. We're going to lift it up. We're going to do this. We're going to lift it up and then move it over and all that stuff. Okay. 
So let's see one of the tests. So here it is, it's over there. Okay, now the reason why it's over there is this test is the L test, okay? So now it, uh, it, uh, it, this is the third flight, okay? And then it's gonna come back. Now, now who is looking at it is Percy. Percy's looking at it. Now, the Ingenuity has a downward looking camera and an outward looking camera and an altitude sensor uh, and, and that's about it. And six batteries that, you know, you look like you got it, you know, Home Depot or something, okay, they're, but they're not. <laughs> they're, they're, they're special batteries. And then it has a, a, a solar panel on the top that charges it up. So it can, it can fly for three minutes or so, and um, uh, we've tested the heck out of it. We're now, we've just finished our 13th flight. It's passed the five flights where the, all the engineering flights work perfectly. Now we're pressing it into service. It is now scouting out positions that Percy can go, telling us, oh, no, Percy can't go there. Don't, don't plan your route there, but we can make it out over here and we can do here. So as we, we're at the bottom of the delta, so we're going to have to keep moving, and then we found a path to, to go up and onto the delta, taking samples all the way up, and then we're going to go up the river valley. So, Jim, you didn't just happen to throw something into the ingenuity that would suggest flight on Earth, would, did you? We did, we did. This is a, a historic moment, and we had a wonderful opportunity uh, to place a very small fabric that came from the Wright brothers onto the copter. So it's uh, the Wright flyer, a little piece of material is uh, is uh, now on Mars. <laughs> just amazing. Th th just thanks amazing. to uh, thanks to uh, uh, Air and Space Museum and and uh, and uh, the Smithsonian Institute. Just amazes me that we would be, you know, this concept of exploration really has changed completely, right? In one level, it's now we're digital. Uh, we're we're light years away. And yet at the same time, it's connected directly to our commitment as humans to continue to explore and think about what is out there and what is out there, whether it be out there in Western Virginia or whether it be out there in California from where I come from or whether it be out there on the moon or on Mars. It's a remarkable part of what makes us human. And I thought this was a beautiful exposition example, a symbol, symbolic moment to try and talk about that. Do you have one? I have, yeah, I've got a question from the, from the room here, and it, it, uh, an important part of Mount Vernon's mission is educational. Uh, and someone in the room, I don't have a name attached to this, but it asked a great, a great question about uh, STEM teachers uh, working towards uh, educating the next generation and the generations beyond that. Um, do you have advice? Uh, for preparing future scientists, for preparing future explorers, uh, what what advice do you, to get, you do you give to educators? So um, uh, I've interviewed a lot of scientists. I have a podcast called Gravity Assist where uh, I interview scientists, and at the end I ask them how they got into the field. What was that spark, that that pull, that gravity assist that pulled them into the field that they're in? And it's teachers. It's books, okay? It's events that they came to. You know, I today saw kids all over the place enjoying the, you know, the, the grounds and the mansion and, and, and listening to them talk and, and what they got out of it. Uh, those experiences we have to continue to give our kids. And the reason why we have to do it in many, many times, perhaps many times, is it takes them a while to assimilate and then put the, put the pieces together. Something happens when it clicks and they get it and they say, that is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes that happens when they're 10 and sometimes that happens when they're 30. Okay? <laughs> but... but um, uh, you, you know, we want to be able to inspire teachers. How I got into this business was from a chemistry teacher. 
um, uh, who ended up working at, uh, as the uh, director of an observatory, a local telescope that was given to the high school. It was a 12-inch Alvin Clark refractor. Where is this? Burlington, Iowa. And I can take a pen and stick it in the middle of the country. That's where I'm from, hmm. right on the Mississippi. And, um, and Don Vinson uh, was so excited about this observatory, he took a summer, went to the University of Iowa, and took an astronomy course, came back to high school, and taught astronomy. They wouldn't let him teach it during the, during the school year. He had to teach it after school. And 25 of us signed up for it, okay, and loved it. And uh, we had an astronomy club. And, uh, and so four or five of us really got hooked. So I did a lot of astrophotography. I built instruments behind it. Uh, some of the astrophotography I did, I submitted to Sky and Telescope, which, is pu which published it. And I was in high school. <laughs> okay. So when I went to the University of Iowa, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And that was to, to get into space, to get into astronomy, to understand the universe and understand our place in it. And so I took Astronomy 101, very first course from James Van Allen. And James Van Allen uh, was our very first space scientist who developed an instrument that flew on Explorer 1 right after Sputnik flew. That was our mission that went and discovered a high intensity set of radiation belts above the Earth that have been named Van Allen belts. Okay. And um, Van was great. Oh, what a wonderful teacher. And, and uh, I loved everything that was going on, and I got an undergraduate degree, a master's, and a PhD, all at the University of Iowa. And, uh, and uh, I was building spacecraft and testing things and doing data analysis. It was, it was a wonderful time. And NASA hired me right off the bat. That's great. <laughs> it's an amazing thing to, I, I'm an historian. Uh, a long time ago in my life, I spent uh, summer working with my doctoral advisor, Sally Gregory Colstead about the emergence of the AAAS in the United States American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I got to read, and it's amazing how many of these young men, mostly at that time, but not entirely, came out of Burlington, Iowa, or Ohio, or the middle of the country, often middle class homes. And they became the professionals that then taught the next generation of professionals, the next generation of scientists. Right. It's, it's a remarkable legacy that I think we underestimate in our society. We often look to the, to the brilliant minds, the, the singular entrepreneurs. But uh, science is that, that thing, just like history, where a lot of it is done by, uh, by people who are just yeah. totally enthralled by the concepts of, of what they do. In my case, right. my mother turned to me, I, I got my PhD, and I turned to my mom and said, when did you know what to become an historian? She said, when you were six. And so it's that kind of thing, where, yeah. where you do. Right. I, I, I feel compelled to push us a little bit further with the other push stuff. Push away. <laughs> and there's two areas that I think are really interesting. One is a little frightening to me, and one is more frightening to me, and I can't figure <laughs> out which one it is. The first is, after years of public agencies experimenting, we now have William Shatner entering the space. Sure. We have this competitive marketplace around space. Yeah. This entrepreneurial exploration. I personally, I'm an urban plan. I teach urban planning and urban history. I'm reminded of that moment in the early 20th century when automobiles appeared and there were like dozens of, of, of car companies. Yeah. And gradually we got to the big three, mm -hmm. right? And this jostling for a place in the new transportation market, it just amazes me at some level uh, I've always wanted to be beamed up by Scotty, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Do you think we're going to have highways to the moon, freeways to Mars? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no question about that. So what we just witnessed was a seminal event in our history. And, and how I look at it 
is indeed look back in history to see other things that are similar. When Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic, he needed backers. He needed people to invest in planes and the idea of making it on his own. And, and you know, at the time, you can read, read what the public was saying. You can, you know, I, I, you know, my grandparents were alive during that time period. And some of the things were all about, why is that so important to cross the Atlantic in 32 hours or 36 hours? I could take a boat, you know, it might be a week, but you know, I can get there, right? And we take that for granted today. Flying now is something we do, it's ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. What's the next step? A low altitude spacecraft can orbit the Earth, complete Earth, in 90 minutes. We're watching the start of leaving New York and in 45 minutes landing in Tokyo. Wouldn't you rather go that way? I'm ready. Than the 14 hour flight it takes <laughs> to get there? <laughs> so, so this is the era we're in. I mean, it's tremendously exciting. And so also what's happening is the concept of what we've learned from space station. You know, NASA's built a, a, a fabulous laboratory in space where we conducted hundreds of experiments in many different ways. Many revolutionary things have come, come from some of the things that we've done, and we've invited others to join us, not other countries and governments, but groups that are actually pharmaceutical companies that know they can develop drugs and do it more purely in space, and many other, many other activities that are going on. So the concept of having, having commercial activities in space is just around the corner, okay? In the meantime, NASA's moving on. We're, you know, we've got planetary scientists working on Mars, discovering what's there, you know, that's, that's in our future. We know enough about the moon and we're building the infrastructure to go to the moon. And we're going to be able to learn to live and work on a planetary surface. The difference between what we're planning to do now and what we did with the Apollo is night and day. The Apollo missions were a matter of a few days on the surface and come home, short little sorties, all right? Our plan is to go to the moon and stay for days, weeks, and perhaps several months, okay? And we, we've picked locations in the South Pole. You know, that's the general location. We're now getting down to narrowing where the landing sites will be. Uh, it turns out one of the most fabulous discoveries about the moon uh, that was just made recently is that we have found what we believe is a fairly good cache of water in permanently shadowed craters on the south and north pole of the moon. So the polar axis uh, only moves by a degree and a half. So that means any impacts that occur at the top, if water got in, it's frozen, it ain't going anywhere. And it has built up over the last four and a half billion years. And we think there, we think there are several hundred million tons of water in these permanently shadowed regions. Now, why is water important? Well, that's one of the things that is critical. You know, water is a chemical composition of hydrogen and oxygen. H, hydrogen, O, oxygen. H, two, O, two hydrogens to one oxygen. We can take that and we can drink it. Drinking water on the moon, H, two, O. It's the same stuff, you know? It's not that it's on the moon. It's different than what we have. It's H, two, O. Still the huh. same chemical composition. You can take it apart, you breathe the oxygen. Take it apart, you can create rocket fuel. And so those are the basic things that that water can provide us and allow us to be sustaining in these areas for long periods of time. So we don't have to take everything there. That enables us then to learn and live and work on a planetary surface. And what we learn from that, from a human exploration point of view, we're gonna feed forward to Mars. That will then be the next big steps. So you talk uh, 
earlier today, we discussed the idea of terraforming these places. And again, I'm an urban planner who deals with community plans in places that have been terraformed to death, right? And yeah, we're good at terraforming. We're yeah, terraforming really, the heck out of this really planet. good at terraformers. <laughs> and so, you, how do, are there NASA, NASA space, are there NASA people beginning to think about the sustainability of this terraforming to ensure its positioning, to imagine its design? Correct, there are. So you have to spend time on your future or you don't have a future. Right now, the concepts of how we would live and work on the planet Mars uh, is, is done with information we find and the models that we create. It's done in a supercomputer. Okay, that's where the new concepts are, are coming together. Uh, right now, from orbit and from the, our, our rovers and, and other, uh, we have a couple other uh, platforms on the surface, like, uh, like uh, uh, Insights on the for, for surface. It has a weather station. Uh, Perseverance has a weather station. Uh, uh, Curiosity has a weather station. And from that data, we can put together a global circulation of Mars. We can actually give you uh, uh, what the weather is anywhere on Mars over a few day period and watch it evolve. We do that in supercomputers now. Okay, we are where NASA and NOAA was working on climate in the late 60s, early 70s. You can right and turn on the TV and you can see the weather patterns and they can tell you this hurricane's gonna go here and all that. Those are all done in models and supercomputers based on the physics and what we know and what we need to know. We've got that basic information at Mars. We know where the weather is on Mars. So the winds can blow as much as 125 miles an hour at times on Mars. Dust storms come every 20 or so months. Uh, you know, the sun beats down for, in particular during the summer in the southern hemisphere and a lot of the dust storms start. Sometimes they go global, sometimes they don't. We're starting to understand that and we're starting to model that. And the dust is wonderful because we think we can use that to build buildings, to build things using our 3D printing capability that we have now. So um, uh, how we were able to live and work on Mars uh, we have to we have to uh, do in supercomputers and model based on the information we have. It also tells us what new information we need to go get. And that will happen over the next 10 to 15 years uh, as we design new missions to then uh, to then get that information. Do you have one? Yeah, I do. And obviously, I love everyone in the room. But when young people ask questions, it jumps to the top of the queue. Uh, I've got one more young person question, and, and, and actually it leads me to something I wanted to ask you anyway. Uh, he, he or she, uh, I want to say it says kid, so it could be, uh, uh, he or she is asking uh, about uh, the sky crane. Yeah. Uh, and, and suggesting that it sounds very complicated. Why, why was it selected? And that led me to think there's a lot of people in this process thinking through the ways that we might go. And I wonder if actually, I actually have no idea how many people are involved in one of these endeavors, how many people are involved in planning and the execution of these things. Quite a few. So talk to us a little bit about, about yeah. the sky crane yeah, and about tell the you collaboration. Yeah, right. So um, uh, I want to talk about one individual uh, uh, on the um, sky crane. It's um, Adam Selzner. And Adam was a high school dropout. Couldn't figure out what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. Okay, and finally got involved, really got excited in engineering, and um, uh, finally got his high school degree and uh, ended up at JPL, the top engineer developing a new method to land a vehicle, one ton vehicle, on the surface of Mars. And he pulled it off. Okay, he's written a book about it. It's uh, the name of the book is. Uh, right kind of crazy and here's why it's the, the title is uh, appropriate we have landed several things on mars before uh, uh, sojourner is a small uh, uh, rover about the size of your microwave oven sitting on a platform called pathfinder encased in a pyramid and then uh, encased in kevlar uh, uh, bags that were inflated 
and the thing was dropped on the surface. And it bounced 30 times before it finally settled down and the bags deflated. And they deflated in a way where the pyramid was always up and the platform would lay down and the rover would roll off the platform. When was this? Sojourner in the 90s. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the concept then that was successful, this then fed into spirit and opportunity, same basic architecture. Those were only, you know, less than 200, you know, uh, uh, kilograms. So they're not, a, they're, they're a fifth of what the, uh, the mass of curiosity is. They also came down on platforms. So you have to put something on a platform. Not as a one ton rover, put it on a platform. Can you land it? The center of mass is so high, it falls over. So Adam said, let's put the platform on top of it, okay? And now we're gonna land it on the surface. How do we get the platform off, okay? And you get the platform, and the platform's got the retro rockets, okay? That slow everything down and set it down on the surface. So then the concept is, we do this every day on Earth. Helicopters raise and lower material, you know, pallets and stuff, and take them off and go do this. Let's just hover and then lower the vehicle down to the surface, set it down, and then with the lines, explode the, with exploding bolts, get rid of the lines, and then send a signal to the, to the sky crane. This is called the sky crane to fly away and crash. That was his idea. Completely sound engineering from one end of it to the other. And when um, uh, Mike Griffin, uh, the uh, NASA administrator, uh, saw it, he said, wow, that looks like the right type of crazy. <laughs> and loved it. And so, um, right kind of crazy, I think is the name of the book. But, um, but um, uh, it works. It's great. It's, uh, and... Uh, it's and all about engineering. Curious about the number of people. In the oh, hundreds. Uh, there were, he had quite a, quite a team of people working with him. Amazing. Yeah, it really is. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned, um, we saw the helicopter. That, that had to work perfectly on its own. The whole so that we have to upload the software. Here's your plan. This is what you're going to do. You're going to do this, this, this. Go over there. Fly over there. Take these images. Fly back. Sit down. Send the images back. Go do it. Okay? Why can't we joystick it? Well, Mars is so far away, you know, when, right now, Mars is on the other side of the sun, okay? So we're, we're one astronomical unit away, you know, 93 million miles, and Mars is one and a half that distance on the other side. That's 22-minute light travel time. So when we do these, we do these uh, uh, tests, we upload the program and let the, let the helicopter go, which is phenomenal, okay? And then, of course, uh, you know, uh, in the modern social environment we have today, both Percy and, and Curiosity, uh, you know, tweet out what they did today, okay? <laughs> you know, George Washington loved travel logs. You go to his library, he loved to read about people's adventures in different countries from India to, you know, to, Ireland and other places that they were going on love travel logs, and basically, I think his first book was basically a travel log, his journey uh, that he took uh, right. to deliver orders, um, and and um, and so I can just imagine him reading what was happening on Mars with Spirit and Opportunity or uh, uh, Curiosity and uh, Percy. <laughs> He'd love it. Well, think, thinking about meeting people. You know, I read uh, probably seven or eight articles by Jim, and he, everyone seems very carefully, scientifically produced, language is cautious, uh, conclusions are incredibly uh, powerful. And then I picked up this article that he sent to Science along with a bunch of other people in February that starts out, ours could realistically be the generation to discover evidence of life beyond Earth. Yep. And I went, wow. Can you talk about this? Yes, I this can. This idea uh, that yeah. we may be meeting some new life form yeah. out there. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the concept of the article is all about, we hear a lot of claims. And in the, in the science realm, 
we have to have rigor associated with it. So we have to have, when somebody makes a claim about, we think this might be life, it's a biosignature, you know, on another planet. Um, how, how, how do we judge that? And, uh, and so we have to create what we call a level of confidence in those detections. And scientists then take that, those observations and then build on them um, and then provide additional observations and confirm them or not, you know, and so it goes through quite a process. And so um, uh, this was all about, hey, let's, let's become more rigorous about this and stop with disclaiming life when, you know, you're nowhere near that. You have a, a, quite the path to do. Um, NASA is indeed quite interested in finding life beyond Earth. And I have to tell you, with our, with our missions at Mars, we just continually get really good observations that just push us a little further towards the idea that, wow, that environment was better than we thought. Wow, <laughs> life was starting on Earth when it, and Mars looked just like that. Why not, right? So we have to seek those right set of observations and really go for it. Um, and we're really, we're living in a fabulous era where we're finding planets around other stars. When, when I was uh, at high school looking through the telescope and going into the University of Iowa, no one in astronomy was talking about any possibility of finding any planet around any star. Forget it. Too tough. Okay, wasn't going to happen. And in my lifetime, we have found thousands. Statistically, we now know there are more planets than there are stars in our galaxy. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's, it, when you think about the possibilities, okay, not every planet in our solar system may have life, okay, Certainly no complex life beyond us, you know, but there are many, many stars with many, many planets. And we just, you know, what are the what is it like on those planets? So we're making huge strides in that area. And I I think we're moving in absolutely the right direction. And in our lifetime, um, I think we're going to answer that question. Are we alone? Wow. <laughs> We're coming in on the home stretch. Now, wait a <laughs> no, 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 no. The question needs to be next is what's the answer, right? Yes. Of course. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. Uh, we have time. Yes. All, all right. right time all for right. that question. Now, let me just say uh, we haven't found it. Please don't walk away thinking we found it. <laughs> but um, as a per in a personal, uh, personal opinion now, I think we will. I think, it, I think we'll find evidence for life, and it will be astounding. If it's microbial, it will be as revolutionary as when we crack the DNA, okay? Uh, if it's more complex, it will, it will be even more revolutionary. When you, once again, you use history to see what, what those kind of announcements are like. You go back to uh, Copernicus, who wrote a book about the planets going around the sun. Everybody knows that today. But then they didn't. They felt everything in the heavens went around the earth. And he said, no, they don't. We are just one of many planets going around the sun. The rest of us, you know, the rest of those things out there are doing that too. You know how revolutionary that was? People at that time had to come to the, group, to the, to the realization there might be life on those planets, and this Earth is nothing special. Wow! That was a worldview change. It was a, it was a revolution in thinking. And um, I think that will happen next for us in that area again. Uh, Noah from Facebook out in the world asked a question <laughs> that I'm curious to hear your answer. What unvisited place in our solar system are you most eager for NASA to explore next? I also don't know exactly what's next on the itinerary um, that we're already planning to explore, yeah. but we haven't got there yet. Where, what, what would you most want, want to explore? 
So I would want to go to a, a moon of Jupiter. It's about the size of our own moon. And it is an ocean world. Planetary scientists, uh, even up until maybe 15 or so years ago, never thought we'd find liquid water in the outer part of our solar system. And the reason why is there's just not enough light from the sun to keep things to keep things in a liquid form. If you take an ice cube starting at Pluto and move it towards the sun, it, there's a place where the, the energy from the sun is such that you can then decompose the ice cube and it sublimates or creates water. Okay, that's called the snow line. And that's somewhere in the asteroid belt. Therefore, water beyond that has got to be frozen. This moon of Jupiter is called Europa. It's got more water water in its ocean underneath its ice crust than we have here on the Earth. And we think maybe twice as much water. It's being fed and heated from tidal forces by Jupiter that's squeezing it. Every time it orbits, it goes through this squeezing process because the orbit is slightly elliptical. Sometimes it's close to Jupiter, gets a squeeze. When it's further away, it releases it a little bit. And that energy has to be dissipated somehow. And it's melted its icy outer crust, except for the very thin part, and created a liquid ocean. And um, that core, the, what's at the bottom of the ocean, we think are hydrothermal vents. <clears throat> and uh, what's happened in 1978 here on our own Earth is uh, we discovered hydrothermal vents. And, uh, there, there's now thousands and thousands of them, but we've been to about 300 of them. And each and every one of them are teeming with life, and it didn't require the sunlight. Hmm. Didn't require the sunlight. Changed our view, all right, completely. So we need to get under the ice shell of Europa with a submarine and go find that life. Now, we are making the first step in doing that with a mission that I helped put together. It's called Clipper. So one of the last things I did before I left Planetary, we're building it right now. It's going to launch in 24 or so, come just a few few years from now, and it's going to it's going to uh, orbit Jupiter and keep flying by Europa. And Europa is this beautiful moon. It's got cracks on it. We think the, the geysers are coming out of these cracks. Okay, I mean it's a dynamic moon. It's absolutely unbelievable. And we're going to set off, set off to the side. We're going to see some of these geysers. And then we're going to dive in it and fly right through them. And then we're going to grab some of that water. And we're going to taste it. And we're going to be looking for life. All right? Okay, that could be coming out in these plumes. And if, if we have any good indication, the next thing is we're going to have to get under the, get under the ice shelf. I think that's a pretty <laughs> good place to stop, don't you? <laughs> Getting under the ice. So, will you please join me in thanking Jim Green, Kevin Furtafield for a really amazing set of conversations. Thank you, everyone. We also are excited to have a, a reception out in the lobby, a, a chance to continue the conversation. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to USC. Thank you to NASA and Dr. Jim Green. And uh, let's see you out in the lobby. Thank you so much.